finally got the assembly woman here with us. How are you, Rodney? I am well. Thank you for having me, Marjorie. It's so <laughs> pleasure to, to be here. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you could join us. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna let the audience know who you are because you have a phenomenal resume. Hello, <laughs> so, Rodney's Bishat Emmeline, because you just got married, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, congratulations. I'm joining the crew. Yes. <laughs> I'm 19 years ahead of you. <laughs> but welcome to the club. Uh, assembly member and state committee woman, district leader for New York State's 42nd Assembly District representing Flatbush, woo -woo, East Flatbush, Midwood, and Dittmas Park in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You were born and raised in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and you are the first Haitian American woman elected in New York City. Mm -hmm. Yes, the first <laughs> engineer elected to New York State Legislature, and the first woman to chair the majority county party in Brooklyn. Whoa, <laughs> you're awesome. Thank you. Oh my gosh. So I I felt like I had to interview you because I you and I met years ago. Yes. As, mm -hmm. um, uh, working and fighting for stillbirth awareness and trying to get legislation with for that. But you, I wanted to talk to you just to share with everyone your recent victory in Albany mm -hmm. um, with the governor signing um, the Jonah Bashak Cowan, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Bill into law. Yes. And I know that was not an easy feat. So um, before we speak about the bill, I just wanted you to tell us the background story. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about your pregnancy and, you know, what happened with that. Okay. Well, um, let's say roughly about four and a half years ago, um, I was pregnant. Uh, 22 weeks, and I went to the doctor uh, to tell them that, hey, um, I, I think you need to check me um, because I was getting some discharge. And initially, they said the baby's fine. I should not have anything to worry about. And then they checked my cervix, and they saw that I was dilating at three, three, three centimeters. So um, they told me that I needed to rush to, to go to the, to the hospital, which is Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. I went, I drove myself crying, of course. And uh, as soon as I got there, um, they took me in, they checked me and literally they told me that um, they could not do anything for me, mm. okay? They told me that um, I was probably too far along and they would not be able to retain me. So I was devastated. I had my cousin call a number of doctors um, who in turn spoke to them and said, it's illegal for you to discharge someone who needs you know, emergency medical attention. Um, she's having a baby and you guys are sending her home. Um, so apparently, um, I, you know, I had this thing called incompetent cervix where um, something that hopefully could have been um, caught earlier, but it wasn't. I, um, I had my best, one of my best friends come and get me and we drove to another hospital. We made arrangements to go to another hospital who was willing to take me in. Um, and there uh, they were able to soclage me. They were able to you know, make sure that I was breathing. I was in, I was in a lot of pain. You know, they gave me um, some meds, um, pain med medication, and they also surcharged me to make sure that we can try to keep the baby in as as long as possible. You know, because of gestational periods, you, right. they, you know, every day counts. Um, not, wait, not to cut you off, but mm -hmm. to me, how was your pregnancy prior to that? So prior to that. Um, I was pregnant with twins. Okay. So before this particular pregnancy? No, actually, this was my only pregnancy. Right. So okay. the, yeah, so I started out with, right, I only had one. So I started out with um, two. two babies. Mm -hmm. And 14 weeks, I found out that I lost one. Okay. Okay. Um, and there, <laughs> there was no type of emotional... Um, no embracing, no hugging, nothing. Um, they just felt that you need to move on. Yeah, you lost one, but you have a healthy one. Mm. It was very emotional for me. Right. Um, so everything was good until 
like I said, um, I started getting discharged and there was something wrong. I felt for some time. I called the nurse. They said, oh, everything's fine until I had the appointment. And that's when they said, okay, you're about to have this baby like very soon, like this week or that day. Yeah. So that, it was just really devastating. Just that whole journey was just devastating. You know, you know, being in your early forties and hoping that you can finally have children right. and um, bring someone into the world to nurture, raise and love. Um, it was just really devastating. And, you know, you build a bond with, you know, the, the little one inside of you, you know, talking to you, <laughs> yeah. moving around. It, it, it was, I mean, that experience was, was beautiful. Um, and I was just hoping to um, just see uh, the, the, the fruition of, of that whole experience. Um, so it was a very devastating to see what women and in particular black women go through um, as it relates to uh, preterm labor. Mm. And so, you know, some, you know, statistics shows that <clears throat> When we're dealing with preterm labor, um, it accounts for about 17% of all infants deaths in America. Right. Black women have a 50% higher rate of preterm birth. And in New York City, Black women are estimated to be up to 12 times more likely to die um, during pregnancy and childbirth than white women, and are three times more likely to suffer from life-threatening complications. And Black infants in America are more than twice as likely um, to die as white infants. And just in New York City alone, uh, uh, black infants are three times more likely to die than um, white newborns. So there's a, a, a national average of 50% increase. Um, we when are part it of that statistic, you know. Excuse me? I said, sadly, I'm, I'm part of that statistics, you know. Yes. You know, and being someone who, you know, had a stillborn child. Mm -hmm. uh, going to be 17 years ago and oh and wow it's interesting that not much has changed since then um actually I, I dare say probably getting you know maybe the same or maybe a little bit worse you know yeah that we live in America and yet this this is this is how things are you know yes yes um so and, and I'm sorry and I'm sorry to hear that and I'm, I'm sure that it's still painful correct oh yeah it's mm -hmm. a different kind of pain, you know, mm -hmm. because it's been 17 years and um, it, you know, and um, praise God for the fact that I was able to have another child, um, mm -hmm. but still, mm -hmm. you know, we think about, I would have two. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, you never really truly heal from it. Right. To be honest, you never truly heal from it. Mm-hmm, mm hmm, mm -hmm. What, what, what did you hear? Or what did you know about pregnancy before you were pregnant? Like, what were you looking forward to besides, of course, your child, but like, what, what are some things you're like, oh man, I was expecting this and this didn't happen. Like, what do you think pregnancy would be like? Well, I think, um, everybody hopes for like the fairy tale pregnancy, you know, I was very excited and nervous and I'm like, oh my God, can I do this? being um you know black woman legislator also it was a election year for me mm -hmm. and it was an election year for a lot of people i was i was pregnant on the campaign trail for a number of other people i saw you yeah <laughs> oh my god and, <laughs> what i said god bless you oh yeah yeah so you know i thought i could be the super mom thing you know i i took like swimming um swimming with mommies, you know, mm -hmm. I, did, I did all that and that wasn't that great. Okay. I was <laughs> <laughs> but it was really good to be around women who were just really excited about pregnancy and just, you know, their first yep. or third. And so it was, a, it was really a good experience talking to everyone. Um, and again, I wasn't aware of the discrimination um, and hurdles that women, especially black women face. Um, you know, and childbirth is no exception. Um, right. I heard a lot of stories before of people who lost their children, who were in pain, and I was just really um, prayerful not to be part of that statistic yeah. of, you know, losing yep. and, and so forth. So it was scary sometimes, because sometimes, you know, you're, you, you know, sometimes you may not hear the baby. Right. You put the monitor on and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not hearing the baby. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like freaking you out and you know every day you're reading okay 
this is uh this is this week the 13th week or the 15th week or the 18th week you know they're growing their hands this is developing. Right. yeah so all of that was um really exciting because i was learning on the go right i had no prior experience i mean i've been a guardian of a, a young child before but i had no prior experience of of labor and what it was and and i'll tell you when i did experience um, labor and pain and, um, um, and cramping and, um, what do you call it? What's the terminology when you're about to go into labor and you're, um, uh, wow. You, okay. <laughs> um, contractions, contractions, right. Contractions. I didn't know I was having contractions until I was having contractions. Cause I didn't know what it was. Right. right? Oh, and first time. it was my first time, but I didn't go to Lamont classes. I, I, I just wasn't prepared. And it was like, you know, early preterm. So when I had contractions, I was like, oh my goodness, this is very painful. And, um, and I, and it was coming every like 10 seconds. Ooh. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. It was coming every 10 seconds. Yeah. I didn't okay. go public. Day. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. It was, mm. Wow. Yeah, but all, all the time though, um, they had put a monitor on me and baby was breathing and everything, you know, while mm -hmm. I was having all these contractions. But I would just say it was it was the, you know, the journey that I went to, at least the part that wasn't tragic, was beautiful. And um, that's good, at least mm -hmm. that memory of it. Yes. Now, was there anything that the doctors like war warned you about or like or things that they you know, cause you know, when I, when I suffered, when we, well, mm -hmm. I, but we, when we suffered a stillbirth, mm -hmm. you know, I never really heard about stillbirth. You know? Right. How, how many, how many months were you? I, we lost him in labor. Oh, okay. In labor. I so you were full term. How many? Full term, 37 oh, weeks. Wow. I didn't even know, I didn't even know that you could lose a child. Right. Like that never even I mean, my, and it's funny, it's ironic, mm -hmm. maybe like a month before he was born, my cousin was telling me about her friend who lost their child in utero. And I was so taken aback. I was mm -hmm. like, that's wow. I didn't know it was possible. But my doctor never talked to me about stillbirth, never spoke to me about anything that could possibly, you know, could go wrong or what mm -hmm. to watch out for other than the obvious. But like, did your doctors talk to you about anything or things to watch out for or look for? No, no. Um, like I said, it seemed very normal at first. And when I, what, what initially when I lost the first baby, um, I asked them, is there anything I need to watch out for, whatever. You know, they didn't tell me to stop with the exercise, you know, cause I was doing exercise. They didn't right. tell me to rest, keep my feet up. And also just so you know, I was swelling during my um, second trimester, which I thought was a sign for preeclampsia. Right. Um, they checked, they did blood work and everything. They said nothing. So nothing about cervical incompetency, you know, never, you know, nothing like that. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you, I, I did a bill on that. Um, there's so many things that could have been prevented, preventative, right? Um, if if they had checked my cervix, maybe between that period that they didn't see me for three weeks, maybe they were able to see that my cervix was shortening, mm -hmm. and that they would have been able to supplage it and put me at bed rest, you know. Um, but you know that didn't happen. Although I did call, you know, it would have been right. great. If they say, "Hey, come in. Let's just check you," and so forth. Which is why I I, I do have a bill on incompetent cervix. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a condition that contributes to premature birth, right, right, uh, or the loss of any uh, you know a, a otherwise healthy pregnancy. Right. And you know, a lot of women don't know the risk factors. Okay, um, abnormally formed uterus. Uh, previous cervix surgery could cause that mm -hmm. short cervix sometimes you're born with short cervix a damaged uterus from a either pre previous miscarriage or a childbirth um, and exposure to uh, des 
and which is a synthetic hormone given to some mm -hmm. women in the past to help them have successful pregnancies. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Also, if you had a bad pap smear, let's say in college or something, and um, you've taken it, you know, you went to a doctor to kind of cure it because, you know, precancer cell, right. that in itself can kind of uh, compromise the cervix. So there's like so many different things that people don't know might be a risk 20 years later, right? Wow. Um, that your doctors should probably be asking you about. Yes, which is why um, for the cervix bill that I have, um, it will require doctors to kind of screen mm -hmm. early on in the pregnancy um, okay. and to like look for a um, um, some type of um, history right. that can potentially be a problem in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're in the hospital, you're mm -hmm. hooked up the monitors, mm -hmm. you're sewn up, what mm -hmm. happens? What happens? I am watching every day, every hour, like baby shows, you know, like um, shows that like an infant would really enjoy. Okay. Um, so I was doing that and listening to a lot of lullabies, praying. Mm -hmm. um, I had a number of people who came and prayed for me. Um, people were coming, but as we, as we're getting closer to tragedy, uh, my water broke. Mm. So again, I didn't know that my water broke until I'm like, hmm. Um, I feel something wet and then the doctors came and they said, your water broke. Mm -hmm. So they had to unsuclage me mm. and let whatever would happen happen. Um, I can tell you while I was, you know, resting with my child and the water, water breaking, I did reach out to my cousin who worked to something similar. However, you know, she actually gave yeah. birth to her twins but she had twins and her water had broken. And luckily for her, her twins was able to survive in her womb for a few weeks. Really? She gave, yeah. With her water bro broken. Yes, with her water broken. So I called her and, you know, she kind of, you know, was giving me some, you know, passages and just talking to me and keeping me afloat and so forth. And, you know, again, all I could think about was my son, Jonah, who, you know, I know would have been strong and so forth. And of course, as a mother, you feel very guilty because you're like, oh my goodness, you know, what can I do to save, you know, my son, right. you know, do, do whatever I need to do to save my son. So after my water broke, um, then, um, then the next day, it looks like I was going into labor. So we were preparing for that. And um, they gave me epidural. Initially, I didn't want it, mm -hmm. um, but they gave me epidural because I was in a lot of pain. And then um, and then the next day, when in the middle of the night of the next day, um, I gave birth. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Jonah came out, and they let me see him and they immediately transferred him into the, the prenatal unit. Um, Thank you. The, yeah, the NATO, sorry, the NICU mm -hmm, um, unit, which where they patched him up and they intubated him because obviously his lungs weren't um, fully developed. Right. Um, so they were, you know, they were working him, whatever. And then uh, uh, eventually I had to make a decision uh, because he was very premium, very small, uh, whether I was going to keep him in the tube or whether I was going to just kind of, you know, let him be. So we had to make that decision and I made that decision. You know, I just thought it was best for him um, to, you know, be with God. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. How did you feel? Like, what was the, I know for me, I, I was like, they had me so high on morphine, like mm -hmm. I had no feeling. So right. like, everyone, and you know, we're both Haitian. Everyone's like, mm -hmm. ah, ah, ah. right, 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 right. Like, falling apart. And I'm just like looking at everybody like, What's going on? Like, okay. Right, right. <laughs> so it wasn't until later that I was able to actually feel mm -hmm. like feelings. So like, what was, you know, making, were you there when you, they actually pulled the plug? So I was very alert. Okay. 
I was very, very alert. And I was the one who actually called the nurse in the doctor and said, hey, I'm going through labor. Mm -hmm. I called them. I said, look, I'm going through labor. I see it. You know, like I feel my baby coming out. And they said, oh my God, you're right. Because, you know, I, I, and then everybody, the whole, it was like in the middle of the night, everybody came up, you know, and we, we did the whole thing. So I was never numb or sleepy or, you know, I, I was always conscious and I, everything, every minute, every second. In fact, I was giving orders. I was like, no, I see my baby first <laughs> and then you can go. So that's what they did. They showed me my baby right. and then they went over to me. Right. Yeah. So in terms of feeling, when I said I was high, I meant like after he passed, I was, mm -hmm. I was too high to feel, mm. you know? So I was wondering, like, I know you were present. So how, how was it? How did you feel when you knew like, this is it? Right. Oh, well, I mean, obviously I was sad. It was tragic. It was, you know, you know, cried, um, nonstop, you know, felt guilty. Yeah. You know, the most, you know, and, you know, every time I hear like, oh, you know, this 23 week child survived or, you know, right. or whatever, I'm like, oh my God, maybe he would have had a chance, you know, you think about that, but it was, um, you know, it was painful and I just had to deal with it. <laughs> you know, I, I just had to deal with the pain. Yeah. You know, with my partner and, you know, that time he probably didn't even know how to deal with it. I, I think he was dealing with it worse than I was. Um, yeah. yeah. But I just had to deal with the pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, what that's the sad part is that mm -hmm. as women, you know, because for us, I think it's harder in a sense where um, not only do we have to deal with the emotional pain, but we have to deal with the physical and we have to deal with the physical up to a year. Sometimes mm -hmm. you know, your body doesn't go back to normal mm -hmm. a year later, if even that, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, yeah, I'm emotionally going through it. And then like my body still thinks I'm pregnant. So it's producing mm -hmm. milk and it's, you know, it's doing all this stuff. And you're just kind of like, I mean, and to your point, you're right. Because I had to pump milk for six months. Mm -hmm. I had milk in my breast for six months. So I had to pump milk for six months. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's like really weird. You know, um, the, the, my never got to my normal weight, which was okay. size six. <laughs> this is four years later. I'm not a size six. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, it was just a new body that, you know, yeah. I had to deal with, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> The right one will love it. Right. Now my <laughs> and, husband, he loves my body, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I mean, it, it, it takes a toll. It mm -hmm. takes a toll. It really takes a toll. So from there um, came the Jonah Bishak Cowan mm -hmm. Law, right? I mean, first you created the bill. What does the law say? What is the law? Mm -hmm. And so what can the, women expect? Mm -hmm. What do women yeah. expect? Okay. Well, in a nutshell... Um, the Jonah Bichot bill literally um, requires hospitals mm -hmm. to attend um, pregnant women who, who are undergoing um, preterm risk, preterm labor risk. Um, so any woman who's, who goes to the hospital, preterm labor, preterm risk, the hospital is required to take you in mm -hmm. and to care for you. Okay. It also, the bill also requires um, that information in a pamphlet mm. are given to women and their family um, on the risk factors of having um, a preterm birth. This is, this is Let me tell you what pregnant. happened. Hmm? This is when they're pregnant, while they're pregnant. Yes. Your doctor while they're pregnant, right. Here. Right? I'm sorry? I said, when you're pregnant, your doctor should say, here. You should right. know about this. Okay. Right. So what happened is, um, I, and, and I'll tell you, I first introduced this bill in 2018 and it finally got passed last December and signed into law about a few weeks ago. Um, so we're really uh, very excited about that. Um, but I have to tell you that most women who are undergoing preterm labor, they do not know of the risk. They mm -hmm. don't think about the risk all they think about is i want my baby saved mm -hmm. so typically you'll have a pediatrician or um, ob um 
who's saying, hey, these are the risk factors, and they give you a long list of complications that can happen mm. um, with the baby. You know, the baby's brain, the growth, everything. They could be blind, they could be deaf, they could, you know, just have any level of disability. And when you're in um, a state of, I don't know, stress, mm -hmm. you're not thinking about the list of risk factors. Right. You're not thinking about that. No. Your family who's with you probably didn't even hear all the things that the doctor said. So this bill will also require that, you know, the pamphlet is given that way when you're a little bit calmer, the, the mother can take time to read it, but also the family members can read it. Right. You know, um, in terms of making a decision after giving labor. Okay. So this is this is monumental. And, and I was saying in live while I was waiting for you, how this law is so important, uh, not only for us right now, but for our children and our children's children, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The expectation is, Ladies, when you go to your OBGYN, you should receive a plan pamphlet warning you about preterm labor, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Expect what to look for. And if you go into a hospital and you're in preterm labor, that hospital cannot deny you, cannot say you, we can't take care of you, right? Because right. now it is against the law. Exactly. That's amazing. Yes. And it's monumental for us, you know, and, and, you know, it's so sad that sometimes things become law because of tragedy, but, right. you know, it's, it, it pays the way for the future. And um, we're just so thankful that you took your pain and you, t and you made it into something that could save many women and many, you know, babies in the future, you know, oh, thank you. Thank that. you. No, thank um, so I just have a couple more questions. You've been sure. very, you've been supportive of the stillbirth mm -hmm. awareness community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have two bills pending. One mm -hmm. is um, the still, stillbirth tax credit and um, mm -hmm. paid leave after stillbirth. What do we, what, what should we do? How can we support? How can we make sure those become law? Well, um, we want to make sure that people are tweeting the law and um, three, tweeting the bills and getting all the advocacy and supportive groups um, together and telling them, hey, we have two great bills that address stillbirth. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, participating, you know, like for example, March of Dimes have been great and Star Legacy Foundation are um, groups that have been very supportive of, of the journey that, you know, you and I went through. Um, and just having a network of people calling the legislators and say, hey, we want this bill passed. Can we, you know, can we pass it now? And that's what it takes. It takes, it takes us being advocates um, and getting the word out, you know, social media, Instagram, um, Twitter, whatever, whatever platform we want to use, Facebook, um, to use that to bring awareness mm -hmm. um, of, the, you know, the whole stillbirth um realm to bring awareness of that and build that that can help minimize stillbirth but also care for people who went through um horrible experience of stillbirth right so we we gotta be we gotta be persistent Yes. So where are, are, who are we emailing? Who are we team, uh, tweeting? Our senators? Uh, your senators, your state senators. Yeah, your state senators, uh, obviously the governor, um, your state assembly members. Um, and then you get them to sign on to these bills mm -hmm. and, you know, they will promote it. I mean, that's what a lot of people are doing for any other um, topic, whether it's like housing, education, whatever. They get the people, they get their colleagues to sign on to the bill, which shows there's a commitment right. in putting this forward and passing it, getting it passed. I, I hear I hear it's no easy feat, right? Because I think these have been pending for a little bit now. And I don't know if things were on pause with you all with COVID mm -hmm. and everything. So um I know that uh yeah, it's 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 mm -hmm. needed. It's needed. So we gotta push, we gotta fight, you know, we gotta yeah. do what we need to do. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And what do you think we can do as women, women of color 
to change the narrative of loss. Mm -hmm. I think we, we as women of color need to be, of course, very vocal, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you know, being very vocal that discrimination is real yeah. and it happens way too often towards, um, you know, black women, women of color who are pregnant. Um, you know, again, you know, the same things that you and I went through, um, a lot of black women went through in terms of being turned away or saying the hospital is too full or, oh, you're not in pain or no, I don't see any blood bleeding and the person is hemorrhaging. Um, we need to make sure that um, we have resources available for us doulas are a big thing mm -hmm. yeah. um, they say that mm -hmm. women of color who have doulas um 98 of the time they don't lose their children because you have someone who's building Absolutely. a relationship with you caring and nurturing and helping you mm -hmm. um and i think that's huge because a lot of times um we as black mothers who are expecting children we don't have a relationship with our OBGYN. i literally only met my OBGYN once once mm -hmm. Yes. So we encourage Black women or women of color, Hispanic women, Asian women um, to participate in the fight mm -hmm. because our babies matters too. Our lives matters as well. And to be vocal, be vocal about the stories, be vocal about, um, um, you know, calling on our legislators to, to help push the agenda um, and making sure that Black women expectants are are surviving and the kids and their children their infants are still surviving in brooklyn last year we lost um a number of black women um to a pregnancy the childbirth uh, amber rose isaac i don't know if you remember mm -hmm. the asia washington they have like a big beautiful mural of her or cardiel street and all of these incidences where black women who died giving giving birth and they, these deaths were preventable, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I cannot imagine how many other women are going through the same thing that's not even reported. Right. Um, and, and, and if you listen to the husbands of these women, they feel that it's a conspiracy of, of killing Black women who are, you know, black expectants um, who are coming into the hospital. You see a lot of people coming into the hospital, a lot of these expectants come to the hospital, but they're not coming back out, right? Alive. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, again, we just, as women, black women, we gotta be vocal and yeah. take a stand on these, these issues. It's tough, it's, you know, women in general, it's tough being a woman and, you know, mm -hmm. a little extra, it's tough being a black woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, know? yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, we definitely got to work hard for um, just to have the same rights to be seen and to mm -hmm. be heard, you know, um, and that's, that's very important. Right. So, my last thing, my last thing is I have a bone to pick with you. Okay. <laughs> so, my husband and I went to the mail and, and he got this in the mail. Okay. <laughs> also, I said, I said wait, how'd you get that? I don't know, I'm special. I'm like, but my birthday passed. I didn't get one. <laughs> it could have been COVID. It could have been COVID. I'm like, I don't know. I was like, that even right. I love this. I love how you're reaching out. Oh, oh I'm it's happy he got it. Birthday. Happy belated birthday. <laughs> He's so happy. Yeah, his birthday was February 5th. But you oh. know, it's funny. For many years, I thought I was in your district when I lived in um uh Argyle. Uh -huh. And it wasn't. So I, you know, I'm, you know, whenever I uh, you know make a comment on your thing. I always call you my assembly woman. Right, but, right, right. But you weren't my assembly woman till last year. <laughs> <laughs> I do have like one or two blocks of Argyle, but yeah, most yeah. of it is not mine. It wasn't, it wasn't my block. <laughs> it wasn't the last year we moved into your district. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're really in her district now. So I can see why the years before I didn't get it, but okay. this year I will be expecting my birthday. Yes, party. yes. And when is your birthday? November. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I had time. I was just so jealous. I'm like, when I speak to her today, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank um, you we're for having so me. 
so proud of um, this law and um, we pray that it will save many lives, many women's lives and many babies' lives. Um, and we're hoping that you continue to stand with us for the stillbirth um, bills and yes, um, that definitely. they may get it to become law as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I appreciate you so much. I, you. I, I appreciate you too and all your advocacy and all the great work that you're doing. You. you know, Mrs. New York. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Positive as usual. Always. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, we had technical difficulty, but, you know, there's always a reason why things happen the way that they exactly. do. And um, I love this time with you. So have a great day. And thank you, Sabrina, thank you. for your um, liaison. She was just like a great liaison. She's yes. awesome. <laughs> thank you. And to thank all you, your Marjorie. Instagram followers, you know, thank you so much for listening to me. Yeah. And thank you for being supportive of the Jonah Bishop Cowan and all the stillbirth awareness movement that we're um we're certainly gonna be on top of. Um thank you, Marjorie, for your steadfast leadership. <laughs> <laughs> where where can um people find you? Well, they can find me well on Instagram. It's R B I C H O T T E R B Shot. Um, they can find me um, at thirteen twelve Flatbush Avenue. Mm -hmm. If they need to call, they can call at 718 940 428 Thirteen twelve Flatbush Avenue in the middle of Little Haiti. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> minted, newly minted Little Haiti. And yeah. are you on Twitter as well? I am on Twitter. I am A.M. Bishot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we heard it here and thank you again. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.